I'm revisiting a project that I originally built when I was doing the restoration of the Halicrafters SX-62A, the two of those that are in some previous videos. I built this capacitor leakage tester. I built it from an article in Popular Electronics. The original article appeared in the December 1959 issue of Popular Electronics, which I have downloaded from the website you see there, AmericanRadioHistory.com. It's a leakage tester, and this was originally the circuit. I have modified the circuit somewhat, partly because the tester that's shown here would only work up to about 200 volts and some of the radios that I restore often have uh, surge currents of 450 or 500 volts so I wanted to increase the voltage but without losing the ability to test the lower voltage capacitors. Now I will point out that this is primarily intended to test the small capacitors like bypass capacitors and coupling capacitors that were used in radios and TVs, primarily tube circuits of the 1950s and 60s and so on. I say that because it's extremely sensitive. And if you try to test a electrolytic with this, you can get an indication and, in fact, this is a very good tester for reforming electrolytics, I'll talk about in a little bit. But it is so sensitive that even the tiny amount of leakage that occurs in a modern electrolytic is a little bit uh, too much for the indicator. The indicator is a very sensitive neon bulb, and it will sense leakage equivalent to about 20 mega ohms, and I'll show you that in a minute. But first, let me demonstrate how the tester works, and for that I'm going to turn off some lights here. Uh, and the way it works is there is a switch at the top here, which we'll look at on the schematic later, that selects the voltage. Low voltage, relatively low voltage, that is, half voltage, and full voltage. I'm going to go with full voltage on this one. And this full voltage, this is a 630 volt capacitor I'm testing. So watch the neon bulb when I flip this switch to on. You notice that it blinks once. I turn it off. And by the way, when I turn this off, I, I'm using a switch that shorts the leads. So it discharges the capacitor. And then I turn it back on. And you see it blinks once. If you leave the power turned on, it should not blink again. In other words, a single blink and then off forever is an indication of a good capacitor. I mentioned that I have a switch here which switches the uh, voltage. What I didn't mention is that the unit plugs in to a transformer. Now this is an ordinary transformer that people in the US use to step up 110 volts to 220 volts to operate small uh, appliances that are designed to run on European current. I'll also point out that this is actually a cord off an old Christmas tree light and it has fuses in it. So not only does this provide isolation, but the fuses also protect you against uh, primarily fire. I will caution anyone building anything like this that plugs into the AC line to be extremely careful. If you don't know what you're doing, find someone as a mentor because these do produce high voltages. And because on one side of the line, if you were, for example, to plug this straight into the AC line, which you can do, uh, but that puts AC voltage 
straight off the mains inside this box. Now, of course, it's all sealed up now, but when it's open and you're working on it and you have this plugged in, you, there are high voltages in there and if you're plugged directly into the AC line, there is a high risk of uh, death or serious injury. So please don't build this project unless you feel competent to work with those voltages. The second thing I'll point out on safety is across the, the lines are pretty high voltage when it's testing. Now, this switch in the original design was a momentary push-button switch so that you would push it down, see the blank, turn it loose, and it would immediately short the leads of the capacitor. One problem with using a uh, switch that remains in the on position is in addition to getting the blank, now there is high voltage across those lines. And I'll turn this on and let's take a look at how much voltage there is. 597 volts. Now, you may notice that when I put the test lead on the capacitor, the bulb comes on dimly. This is an 11 megaohm meter. So it is sensing 11 megaohms of leakage when that is on. When I take it away, you notice it goes back out. That's one reason that it's not really as good for testing electrolytics. It will test them, and I'll show you an electrolytic here in a minute and how it uh, operates. But the main reason I put the switch on instead of having the momentary switch is so that I could use this to reform electrolytics. The way you do that is you attach the leads to the electrolytic observing correct polarity. Then you turn on the switch. That permanent voltage across the capacitor slowly reforms the electrolytics. And because I'm using a very large series resistor inside the design, as I'll show you when we get to the schematic, it reforms the electrolytics very slowly. So even if they are shorted, you won't do any damage using a uh, tester like this to reform the electrolytics. Furthermore, you'll be able to tell very quickly if the voltage across the electrolytic doesn't begin to rise, you know you have a dead short. If it does begin to rise, you can use the tester to reform the electrolytics up to about 500 or 600 volts. Now, I don't recommend using the 500 volt setting for, or the 600 volt setting. Generally, I use the lower setting, that is the half voltage setting. So let's take a look at the schematic and see what the uh, changes are that I made from the original popular electronics design. Here is the original circuit in the popular electronics article and I suggest if you want to build this that you download that article from uh, AmericanRadioHistory.com. You'll notice they talk about here a push button switch. That's this push the button push button switch here. It uses an NE51 and the original design had 100K in each of the two lines. So when you push the switch, this contact moves from this point to this point, applying the test voltage and the current that flows through the capacitor also flows through this NE51 with approximately 200K in series with it. You'll notice that this is actually a voltage doubler. That is, it takes the 110 volts or 120 volts that is uh, the, the line voltage. And remember, I re recommend you use an isolation transformer on this side. But nonetheless, let's say 120 volts. 
and it doubles it. It puts 120 volts across this capacitor with plus at the top. It also puts 120 volts across this capacitor with plus at the top. So because they're in series, the 120 volts here and the 120 volts here add together to produce a total test voltage of around 240 or 250 volts. One of the things I changed is I put a single 470K resistor in series with the NE2 uh, bulb. Still the test leads on the left and when the tester, when this switch is in the bottom position, the full line voltage, that is the full voltage across these two, two capacitors, are applied to the capacitor through this 470K and NE2. 470K because since I'm using the transformer, I'm doubling the voltage. So instead of having 120 volts across, I have about 240 volts across this unit. That means that there is about 240 or actually a little higher than that, 250 volts across each capacitor. The total adds up to over 500 volts. And that allows me to test the old coupling capacitors that have ratings, like the one I was looking at earlier, the uh, yellow one, yellow capacitor that you saw, is a 630 volt unit. So it's perfectly appropriate to test those at 550 or, or 600 volts to see if they're good. As you may have seen in some of my earlier videos on testing capacitors, I recommend that you test every capacitor before you put it in circuit. This is a good way to test those, those high voltage plastic film capacitors that most people like me use in restorations today. However, if you flip this switch to this position, now you're only applying half of the input voltage. That is, a 250 volts to the capacitor. So with 250 volts you can test the lower voltage capacitors, say the ones that have a 300 or a 350 volt rating without overstressing them. Now something that I do not encourage you to do is to use this unit without the transformer unless you plug it into an isolation transformer. If you plug this into an isolation transformer that provides 110 volts or 120 volts or whatever, like a variable isolation transformer, some people will call them variax, then you can basically have almost any voltage you want here. Because, for example, there's nothing about this that uh, requires exactly 120 volts or whatever. You could put 50 volts. AC on these pins, you would then get 100 volts on this capacitor and 100 volts on that one. That switch then would select between 100 volts in the up position and 200 volts in the lower position for your test voltage. And I sometimes do that. I use a variable auto transformer that you see there. Most modern multimeters only have anywhere from 3 volts to 9 volts of total battery voltage. So there's no way they will test capacitors like this yellow capacitor that I was testing earlier with a 630 volt rating. I've connected the tester up to this Nichicon 4.7 microfarad 450 volt capacitor. Now it tests perfectly good on a variety of different testers, including my Sencor LC102, which is the best tester that I own, at least anyway, the most reliable one that I own. So I've got the switch right now in the position where it's only applying about 140 volts to this capacitor. I'm going to turn off the lights and I'm going to flip the switch. You'll notice that the light stays on. Let me zoom in a little more. There you see it finally went out. There I've now applied about 
260 volts to this 450 volt capacitor. But note how long it takes for the capacitor to charge through that 470K resistor. It's getting dimmer. It's harder to see that in the camera so far. But the light is getting dimmer and dimmer. I hope you can see that. There it finally went out. Now that shows that it's a good capacitor. But notice that the light keeps coming on every now and then. And the reason is that these electrolytics, despite being a perfectly good brand new Nichicon capacitor, 105 degrees C, in other words, about as good as a, as a hobbyist can afford to buy, the tester is still so sensitive that it is measuring that tiny amount of leakage current. This would certainly pass any test for use in a radio or a TV or even a modern switching power supply or things of that sort. But nonetheless, you see that it does go through a cycle of recharging the capacitor to make up for the little bit of leakage that occurs even in these modern electrolytics. I am doing this partly in response to some people who couldn't find the particular part of the SX62 restoration where I talked about this tester. And I did it in part as a completion of the capacitor testing series that I've been doing lately. So, I probably will not revisit capacitor testing, at least not for a very long time. But in the meantime, have a nice day.